On the afternoon of the 12th of January 2020, an experienced pilot of an amateur-built Whitman Tailwind aircraft left Toowoomba for Evans Head in New South Wales. The purpose of the flight was to pick up a passenger at Boona and then attend the Great Eastern Fly-In at Evans Head. That morning, the event was cancelled due to a low cloud base at Evans Head. The event's cancellation prompted the pilot to return to Toowoomba and contact relatives there for an update on the weather. They said the cloud at Toowoomba was not really low, there was no wind and there had been some rain. At 13.36, the pilot departed Evans Head Airport with one passenger on board. The pilot was conducting a private flight under the visual flight rules to Toowoomba via Boona. At 13.53, the pilot started a 180 degree turn overhead the township of Kyogle and diverted, likely due to low cloud on the intended flight path. At 13.57, the pilot flew south back down the valley to Casino Aerodrome, landing at 14.06. While on the ground at Casino, the pilot contacted a friend in the area and left a voice message stating they had landed at Casino because they could not get past Kyogle due to the weather. Nearly 50 minutes later, at 14.54, they took off again into what seemed to be safe weather. The pilot flew in a west-northwesterly direction. At 15.10, the aircraft began a series of rapid descents and climbs between 3,100 feet and 4,000 feet, followed by a left descending turn. Shortly afterwards, it collided with terrain. The pilot and passenger were fatally injured and the aircraft was destroyed. My name is Steve Creedy. I'm a Senior Communications Officer at the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, or CASA. Today I'm joined by an expert panel to explore this tragic story. We're going to take a look at what happened and how it led to the fatal outcome and how pilots can avoid situations like this. On our panel we have Michael White, Acting Aviation Safety Advisor, Team Leader with CASA. Michael Paik is an Operational Forecaster at the Bureau of Meteorology and Senior Forecast in the Brisbane Aviation Forecasting Centre. Melanie Waddell is an award-winning and highly experienced pilot and currently a Flight Operations Inspector for CASA. Chase Eldritch is a Flight Instructor in Brisbane and Industry Consultation Coordinator for CASA. Welcome everybody. Michael, I might start with you. The pilot was experienced and made the right decision to uh, change their plans when they landed at Casino. Uh, what do you think was happening when he decided to take off again? I think the pilot was attempting to make a second uh, flight across the McPherson Ranges and unfortunately that's led the pilot into marginal and deteriorating weather conditions, particularly as he progressed towards <coughs> higher terrain, for example. Uh, the, the issue with that is uh, when a pilot enters those conditions and they're not qualified to deal with that as an instrument rated pilot, uh, they run a very real chance of suffering spatial disorientation. Spatial disorientation uh, occurs when you lose reference to the natural horizon, for example. So the, your external cues from the uh, aircraft uh, are taken away from you and we lose about 80% of our orientation ability when that sort of uh, situation occurs. Yeah, what was happening with the altitude? The plane seemed to be going up and down. Well, there's probably a number of reasons for that. One, if the aircraft is under control in flight, the pilot is probably trying to avoid the worst of the cloud and maintain that requirement for in-flight visibility. Uh, the other reason for that is the pilot was suffering from spatial disorientation and having lost control of the aircraft, the aircraft pitches up, the aircraft might pitch down and ultimately the aircraft will go into a, a, a quite a, a heavy spiral descent um, until such times as the pilot might be able to um, recover from that situation. All right, so what does the pilot actually experience when he gets into this kind of weather? Uh, Mel? This can be quite an individual thing because everybody's bodies react differently, but if you become spatially disorientated, it can be quite confusing because what you see and what your body feels is not the same. There's a mismatch. And so some people feel nauseous in this case, other people start to react to what their body says because they're used to reacting to your body. But you can't do that in a plane because you can't see what's happening. And so your body might say that you're leaning, but you could actually be in fact leaning the opposite direction in the aircraft. So you need to trust your instruments, which is very difficult 
for pilots that don't have a lot of IMC experience. In this situation, your eyes, what you're seeing and what your body are feeling don't match anymore. Michael Pake, can you tell us uh, a bit about what the weather was doing on that day and uh, what he encountered? Yeah, certainly, Steve. Look, it was a fairly uh, moderate to fresh, very moist southeasterly airflow flowing over northern New South Wales that day. As the air moved inland and started to rise up the, uh, the Great Dividing Range, um, we encountered an extensive cloud cover towards the, uh, the tops of the ranges on the New South Wales side. However, as the air went over into the Queensland side, it does dry out somewhat and there was uh, a little bit less cloud on the Queensland side. So there's a possibility that he went up to have a look at the weather and see what was happening on the other side of the ranges, not realising what was actually there. Look, that might have been the case, Steve. Look, it's probably at this point, it's really um, prudent to have a, have a look at how clouds are actually formed. Um, and that's an important part of this, this situation that, that we're faced with in, in, in this uh, situation today. Look, clouds form when moist air cools um, to the dew point temperature. And the dew point temperature is a temperature where water vapour in the air condenses out to water droplets and then becomes cloud. And one of the most common ways for air to cool is as it rises. And um, often that happens as the air approaches some topography, a mountain range, and then it rises up. And that's what was happening most likely in, in this situation, that we had clouds um, forming as the air rose and up towards the top of the, uh, the mountain ranges and, and on top of it and on the New South Wales side of, of those mountain ranges. Research has, has indicated that uh, if that situation were to occur, that pilot would have had a, an average of about 178 seconds to uh, extract himself, if you like, out of that situation prior to losing control of the aircraft. Okay, Melanie and Chase, have you ever been confronted with dangerous weather and what did you do? My very first experience was my first solo navigation exercise and I had done a very thorough preparation and really read the weather as best I could. But what happens when you're up there is you're faced with a different picture to what you're um, expecting. And in this case, I was doing my first solo navigation, which is a very simple navigation exercise. We had scattered cloud forecast for this day and we did go through some backup plans um, where we might divert or where I might divert if the weather wasn't too good. And about halfway through the second leg, I was confronted with just a sea of cloud, which I wasn't expecting. So what I decided to do is I went through the different possibilities. And at this stage, I decided not to go underneath because there was rising terrain. So what I decided to do was to go over the cloud for 10 minutes. And as it turned out on this day, uh, five minutes into that leg, the sky just opened up again. So this actually worked out, but it doesn't always work out that way. And what about you, Chase? Yeah, I'd have to agree. Um, it's, it's quite often that you come across um, different weather scenarios and situations. The majority of the weather scenarios I've been presented with is, um, I always find myself flying because I really need to. I've got a case of I need to get this lesson done or I need to get this flight done. Um, and that pressure is often when it becomes a little bit more dangerous because you're more likely to push it. Okay, Michael, you mentioned before that pilots have on average 178 seconds to live once they fly VFR into IMC. We have a quick video to demonstrate this. Let's take a look. The sky is overcast and the visibility poor. That reported eight kilometre visibility looks more like three and you can't judge the height of the cloud. Your altimeter says you're at 1,500 feet, but your map tells you there's local terrain as high as 1,200 feet. There might even be a tower nearby because you're not sure just how far off course you are, but you've flown into worse weather than this, so you press on. You find yourself unconsciously easing back just a bit on the controls to clear those none to imaginary towers. With no warning, you're in the soup. You peer so hard into the milky white mist that your eyes hurt. You fight the feeling in your stomach. You swallow only to find your mouth dry. Now you realise you should have waited for better weather. The meeting was important, but not that important. Somewhere a voice is saying, you should have turned back. 
you now have 178 seconds to live. Your aircraft feels on an even keel, but your compass turns slowly. You push your rudder pedal and add pressure to the controls to stop the turn, but this feels unnatural. So you quickly return the controls to their original position. That feels better. But now your compass is turning a little faster and your airspeed is increasing slightly. You scan your instrument panel for help, but you don't find any. It all looks unfamiliar. You're sure this is just a bad spot. You'll break out in a few minutes, but you don't have a few minutes. You now have 100 seconds to live. You glance at your altimeter and are shocked to see it unwinding. You're already down to 1,200 feet. Instinctively, you pull back on the controls, but the altimeter still unwinds. The engine is into the red and the airspeed's almost there too. You have 45 seconds to live. Now you're sweating and shaking. There must be something wrong with the controls. Pulling back only moves the airspeed indicator deep into the red. You can hear the wind tearing at the aircraft. You have 10 seconds to live. Suddenly, you see the ground. The trees rush up at you. You can see the horizon if you turn your head far enough, but it's an unusual angle. You're almost inverted. You open your mouth to scream. Mm, that's pretty chilling. So the pilot made some calls to check the weather, but obviously it didn't help. Um, what's the best place to get weather information? Well, firstly, Steve, look, the, uh, the best place and, and the right place to get the weather from is, is NAPES um, through the Air Services website. Um, and look, the Bureau of Meteorology, we are the authority that provides all of those forecasts and all that information to, to that uh, platform. So that is the correct place to get the weather from. Um, and once pilots have had the opportunity to read them, interpret them, if there's any sort of uncertainties, then you're more than welcome to. In fact, we're encouraging people to, to call the Bureau um, to get that information. At the bottom left-hand side of the graphical airspace forecast, the GAF, you'll find a phone number there that will put you in direct contact with the forecaster who is writing, evaluating and monitoring that, that entire area. They're writing all the forecasts. It's not a media number, it's a, it's a forecaster who is, um, is writing those. So you can ring at any time to get some further clarification on that information. So, so what does NAPES stand for? NAPES is the National Aeronautical Information Processing System. In your experience, do you find some pilots sometimes don't give uh, the weather a uh, very detailed analysis? Yes, it is true. We do find that uh, a lot of pilots, if they get the weather, give it a cursory glance, but we really need to see pilots making a detailed assessment and an analysis of the, of the uh, weather uh, and applying that uh, to their planning and then deciding on the route that they'd like to take, the altitudes they'd like to fly at, uh, keeping a diversion aerodrome available throughout the flight, having a plan B available in case the weather deteriorates. What are some of the other reasons that uh, pilots might fly into dangerous weather? We found that uh, regardless of the length of the journey, they find that the halfway mark uh, on the journey is quite a critical point in time on the journey. The research found that uh, once a pilot has passed that halfway mark on the journey, that they're much more or less likely to uh, make timely, rational decisions based on the latest information that they've got. Once that occurs, then uh, time compresses their decision-making ability and they're less reticent, um, or they're, they're more reticent, I should say, to, to make those rational, timely decisions which will give them that good outcome. So this is this press on itis that we hear about? This is the press on itis that, that, that we hear about. Uh, and in fact, the longer that the flight goes uh, on for, um, the pilots feel that they've made such an investment that they're less likely to make decisions to, to reverse some of those uh, you know, decisions that they've, they've previously made. Are there steps that pilots can take to make a good plan B? Absolutely. Those pre-flight decisions are just really as important as in-flight decisions. Are. So it is really quite important um, to make those early decisions prior to the flight and then they can be carried into flight um, after you've briefed your passengers and decisions can be easily, more easily made in flight if you really do need to make them to divert. So that's 
a scary thought. It doesn't matter how experienced you are. Even experienced pilots can find themselves in dangerous weather. Just how quickly can pilots find themselves in this situation? Look, uh, weather is not a static situation. Um, it does change, maybe not on the order of seconds or even a couple of minutes, but certainly over a short amount of time. For example, thunderstorm formation. From nothing to 30 minutes to get a thunderstorm is, is quite normal in the tropics. And look, our, our forecasts, they, they give the most likely outcome for, for the situation. The weather that you actually encounter may be just a little bit different to what you might get um, on, on the forecast. So it's important that pilots are, are ready for that and are aware that while this is the most likely outcome, there might be some changes in the weather that, that you see. What should a pilot do if they're confronted with conditions that means they can't fly under visual flight rules? Uh, look, what, what they should do um, is in the pre-flight stage of uh, their journey, they should have assessed those uh, requirements or the likelihood that they're going to be confronted with marginal uh, conditions and um, they need to make early decisions about whether to divert uh, or turn around and go back. But also when we're talking about plan B, you don't want to have your mindset that you always have to go where you were aiming to go. Have a plan B that's in a complete different direction. Um, you can have a mindset of I'm trying to get here and I don't know where I'm going to end up, but I might go here. You may be able to get halfway and pick up a car. So try and think of backups that are not just having to do with flying from A to B and diverting from B to C. So Mel, how do you plan for your flights and what's on your personal minimum checklist? I do as much preparation as I can, consulting the URSA, country airstrip guides, local knowledge, just depends on how far the flight is. Um, and then I use a personal checklist and the one that I use is the CASA personal checklist. And that's available on the CASA website. When a pilot goes into adverse weather, what are some of the behaviours that they experience? They'll, they'll notice things uh, uh, like a, uh, a thickening of the cloud base, a, a lowering of the the cloud base, a uh, darkening of the cloud base. They might notice the gap between the natural horizon and the base of the cloud narrowing. Things like the wind might back, the temperature might go down, it might start raining so they might be flying into a little bit of precipitation. So they're the signs that the pilots would need to look for to start making those early decisions about diverting. So um, Mel, when you're up in the air, what are you looking for in terms of clouds? What I'll do is I'll just take a good look at the picture in front of me and around me, not just in the direction that I'm going. And then I'll listen to the cues from my body. If I'm feeling uneasy, then it means the way that I'm going may not be the direct, correct direction to continue. Chase, have you ever made a precautionary landing? I've certainly had to make landings I, I didn't intend on when I took off. I often find the, the earlier you make that decision, the better the options you have available. So you might not need to make a precautionary forced landing as such, but you might um, you know, end up at a diversion or with a diversion or at an alternate airfield. So I guess the idea, Michael White, is uh, not to have to make a precautionary landing. They're dangerous uh, and it's a, a pilot's last option. What should they be looking out for? They're essentially in an emergency situation. So some of the things that they, um, they, they should be considering is uh, declaring an emergency with uh, ATC, so on the appropriate area of VHF frequency. Uh, things to look out for. Um, if they can possibly detect uh, is the wind to enable a precautionary landing to be made a, as much as possible into wind because that reduces your ground speed. Also to assess things like uh, ground obstructions, power lines, poles. Um, if you're going to carry out a precautionary landing, do it as close as you can to civilization where somebody is likely to, to see you and, and, and assist you if you need it. You need to uh, carry out a, a, a quite a thorough passenger briefing prior to conducting the the precautionary landing. Also, in addition, maybe activating an emergency locator transmitter if you have one. There are all the sorts of things that you need to consider uh, in terms of an emergency precautionary landing. And you need to keep in mind that it doesn't matter how much preparation you do, you're still going to find yourself in these situations. And, and one of the times I was on um, in this area, in Toowoomba, we had done all the preparation. We had called Bureau of Meteorology. And as we were progressing, we thought, this really doesn't look like it's going to be an idea to go on. It started to look like the weather was closing in everywhere. And we had made plans, but then out of the corner of my eye, I saw an airstrip, which looked beautiful to land on. And we looked at the map and it wasn't on the map. And we said, you know what, with this weather, we think landing there is going to be the best option. 
we landed there. Someone who owned the strip came out and said, you know, we thought you might end up landing here with the weather. It gave us an opportunity to just stop and, and take a step back, speak to this person who gave us a bit of an idea of the local weather over and above on top what Bureau of Meteorology had told us. And just as they said, the weather cleared up in an hour like they said it would, we took off and it was, the rest of it was uneventful. Okay, so what do we think uh, the key lessons are here? I think one of the important aspects is to be adaptable. Be prepared to adapt uh, given the circumstances you're faced with at the time. And Michael White? Yeah, take the time to plan the flight. Get the weather, make those critical early decisions at the flight planning stage of the flight and then carry them through and be prepared to change them. Chase? I'd say briefing. So you can uh, have sufficient planning, you can have a great number of options and then involving others in that by briefing them, whether that be a self-briefing, briefing of other flight crew, briefing your passengers so that expectations are set. And finally, Michael Pay. Let's make sure you get your weather and a detailed weather from NAPES. And if you require any further clarification, you can call the Bureau of Meteorology. Okay, thanks very much, everybody. Let's go through some of the key safety messages we can learn from this case study. Before a flight, plan. Look at the weather and give it a detailed analysis. Call the Bureau of Meteorology if you're unsure of anything. Use a personal minimums checklist. Have a plan B in place if the weather changes suddenly. Know when you will make the decision to turn back or hold. During the flight, remember weather changes quickly. Avoid deteriorating weather. Make the decision early to turn back or divert. Call air traffic control if you are in dangerous conditions. Remember, you can call the Bureau of Meteorology to get real-time information on the weather to assist you.